What does your bank, Amazon, and the online multiplayer game World of Warcraft have in common? Multi-factor authentication. Have you ever been texted a code to type in when you're trying to log into account or sent an email with a link to click on? That's multi-factor authentication. It's a cybersecurity procedure with multiple steps that you can use when you're trying to access things with secure information, such as your user account or your online banking account. These sorts of high security, high value accounts are the accounts that hackers spend the most amount of time trying to get into. So that's usually why for preventative security measures, we have multi-factor authentication turned on. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a good understanding about what multi-factor authentication is and also why you might want to turn it on for your personal accounts as well. Hi everyone and welcome to Control Cases series Cybersecurity Simplified. Today we're going to be talking about multi-factor authentication. If everything is working as intended, passwords are a way to prove that you are who you say you are, ideally a piece of knowledge that only you know. If you've heard anything about passwords, or if you've watched our full-length video on how to create a strong password, you should know that it could take millions or even billions of years to crack a good password. So why have any additional security at all? It's a good question, and for many, a strong password may be enough security. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't have passwords that are strong enough to hold up against attackers. And just like any other secret, sometimes it's easy to learn things that you're not supposed to know, and can be done in undetected ways, like brute force testing billions of passwords using powerful cloud computing processors. Even the strongest, most secret password can be breached in a number of ways. So what can we do to make our accounts more secure? It wouldn't do us any good to just add a second password because chances are if a hacker was able to access the first one, they'd be able to access the second one. So what's another way that we can prove our identity? In security, it's commonly said that a user trying to prove authenticity can be identified in three ways something you know, something you have, or something you are. But what does that mean? Well, something you know is easy enough. Your password, for example, is something you know. But this extends to things like your security questions at the bank, your PIN number, even your signature is something you know, since you're the only one who knows exactly how you sign your signature. But as mentioned, knowledge-based security questions are prone to being breached. Just ask anyone who went through the public school system, how easy is it to forge a signature? Then there's the things that you are. These cover biometrics. These are physical things about your yourself that are hard to change. Things like your fingerprint, your exact facial measurements, or even your physical location can be used. If you are buying a bagel in New York one second and the next second you are buying gift cards in Russia, unless you invented teleportation, it's likely that credit card fraud is happening. And lastly, the things that you have. This could include a key, your credit card. Oftentimes nowadays, it's going to be your phone and that specific SIM card. You'll see in a lot of high security situations, a specific USB key will be used to add an extra layer of security. So those are all examples of things that you have. So in short, a password is something you know, a key is something you have, and a fingerprint is something that you are. Multi-factor authentication will have at least two of these factors. Bank cards are a great example of multi-factor authentication that you use in your everyday life. A card is something that you have, and your PIN is something that you know. Some might even argue that physical locks have two-factor authentication. You have the key, something that you have, and then the location of the lock would be something that you know. To put it another way, if you have a key, but you don't know where the key goes to, you just have a strange piece of metal. So why not use a fingerprint and a password? That would fulfill two forms of authentication, right? Well, in physical settings where every device in the system is controlled and trusted, biometrics are a really reliable tool that you can use for access to things like restricted spaces. But unless a company controls every step of the process from reading the fingerprint, processing it, sending it, and receiving it, you can't trust that that system hasn't been tampered with. Second, even in a world where fingerprint readers are really common, you don't know that every fingerprint reader is gonna work in the exact way. So the fingerprint reader on your phone, for example, could work very differently than the fingerprint reader on your computer. Additionally, there's legal considerations when we're talking about this kind of biometric information and storing it in a cloud server, for example. Your fingerprint is really difficult to change, uh, impossible almost. So if your data was being saved on a cloud server and there was a high-tech breach, you couldn't change that data. These serve to show why, for example, Touch ID and Face ID serve better as convenient alternatives to a password, and they have extreme security with how we read biometrics and how they're handled. The reading the reading so that you can't reconstruct the actual fingerprint. For example, with Apple's Touch ID, there's a one-way process called ridge flow angle mapping. They're taken directly into extremely secure internal hardware that's inaccessible from other software on the device, and we call that hardware the security enclave. 
It's only then that the security enclave compares the reading to data that was generated when the fingerprint was initially registered, and then it simply decrypts the username and password and logs you into the site. So that is to say your fingerprint isn't actually being used as the password, it's being used as the key to the password. So if the password is ever breached, you can simply change the password, there's no need to get new fingerprints. You're using something that you are to authorize the computer to remember something that you know. So if there's hurdles with using something that you are in non-physical settings, that leaves one other form of authentication, something that you have. In the case of physical keys, this is easy. You can't unlock the door unless you have the specific object that you need to unlock the door. But if you're not actually with someone, how can you prove that they have something that they say that they do? If you've been working in high security environments for a while, you may have been given an authenticator. An authenticator is a physical option with a readout and a button that generates codes. So when you're trying to log in, you would use the authenticator and if the code generated matches the code generated in the server you're trying to log into, you're authorized and you're allowed to log in with those credentials. Importantly, this code is generated using date and time, meaning it changes by the minute. If someone was looking over your shoulder and copied down the code, it wouldn't work when they tried it later. You have to physically have the device with you to get this to work. By generating a code that's unique to the device and is tied to a date and time, you're able to prove that someone has the actual device when they're trying to log in. These days, this sort of physical authentication device has fallen away to another device. It's a device that pretty much everyone has, and it's able to generate the same on-demand code your smartphone. Authenticator apps such as Google Authenticator replicate this one-time code with six digits that is tied to a minute, and it has all the same resiliency and security as a physical authenticator. It's even more common to actually just get a pin sent to your phone via notification. If you don't get the pin, you don't have your phone, you're not authenticated. Sometimes you can receive this pin via text message, but SMS isn't 100% secure, and there have actually been attacks that are related to this. A phone number isn't always necessarily associated with a specific phone. So an attacker could call up a phone provider and ask them to assign that phone number to a different phone. And that would be an example of a shortcoming of SMS. Of course, as with passwords, attackers can try and get you to log into a fake version of a real site. So this is why it's really important to never share your login codes with someone and to make sure that you're careful about where you're typing these codes into. Another layer of security that can be added into the password and authentication combo is by roughly estimating your location from your IP address. This isn't a foolproof method, but it is an additional layer of security. It's pretty easy to spoof these location sourcing devices, but you can still be notified if you're being logged in in two different locations, for example, and that notification can be flagged to your email. This is one of the largest reasons why getting login notifications is a really great preventative measure. You can get notified if someone has either successfully or tried to log into one of your accounts. Two-factor authentication is an extremely easy measure that can really help increase your online security. You might consider turning on multi-factor authentication even if you think that the website doesn't have very sensitive information. Hackers often go for the lowest hanging fruit. Why would they try to get into an account with multi-factor authentication when they could go for one without them? It's much easier. This is why for somewhat less critical accounts, like an online video game for example, a lot of people will opt in to multi-factor authentication because it dissuades people from trying to hack your specific profile. Even if you don't think a website has access to sensitive information or valuable assets, you never know what giving a little bit of your information to an attacker will allow them to do. And turning on multi-factor authentication just puts your information that much more out of an attacker's reach. So that has been a little bit about multi-factor authentication. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Please comment any other cybersecurity simplified topics you'd like us to cover and don't forget to like and subscribe.